Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, The Importance of Being Mature, All-Site Maturity Assessment in Clinical Practice, organized by the ASHRAE Special Interest Group Embryology. Today, Dr. Zuzana Holopstova will give a presentation on this topic. The webinar will consider the theoretical grounds and methodological aspects of egg maturity assessment using polarized light microscopy. You can answer your questions in the chat box and we will go through them after the webinar. So Dr. Hoptova, I give the floor to you now. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm a researcher who has dedicated part of his research career to study human oocyte maturation. And I'm thankful for this opportunity to show you how basic research findings can be translated to clinical IVF practice. Before touching the topic of oocyte maturity, I will first remind you on the basics uh, of uh, human oocyte development. I will highlight the role of myotic spindle in the process of oocyte maturation and introduce you to principles of non-invasive spindle imaging. Then I will point out the risk of premature fertilization in developmentally delayed oocytes and explain how to optimize time of ICSI in clinical practice. Finally, I will consider the benefits and limitations of egg maturity assessment. So, uh, all set maturation represents the final stage of oogenesis, which is initiated already in the embryo. Here, the population of pluripotent primordial germ cells migrate from extra embryonic region to colonize the area of future gonads. After entry to gonadal ridges, primordial germ cells in female differentiate into small diploid cells called oogonia. After a period of mitotic expansion, oogonia, uh, beca uh, oogon oogonia become proper, uh, propelled to meiosis. Meanwhile, uh, all progenitors become individually associated with single layer of uh, follicular cells forming primordial follicles. Enclosed primary oocytes continues in meiosis until they reach the diplotina stage of prophase of the first meiotic division. Meiosis is then arrested and primary oocytes remain in this dormant state until puberty. During women's reproductive age, groups of follicles grow and primary oocytes enlarge as they pile, pile up nutrition for future embryo development. Only a fully grown oocyte within a dominant follicle becomes responsive to the surge of pituitary hormones that stimulate the resumption of meiosis. The first meiotic division is completed hours before fertilization, uh, and the stimulus uh, to release the blood, the, uh, and the second meiotic division is again arrested, this time at metaphase. The stimulus to release this block is fertilization by spermatozoa. Oocyte maturation refers to relatively short developmental period during oocyte, uh, in which oocyte re-enters meiosis and advances from prophase one to metaphase two stage of meiosis. This process comprises of dissolution of prophase nucleus, also called germinal vesicle, chromatin condensation, spindle assembly, and segregation of homologous chromosomes. In meiosis one, pairs of homologous chromosomes uh, each composed of two sister chromatids, uh, are physically held together by at least one DNA crossover established during embryonic period. During anaphase one, uh, half of the genetic material is expelled to a small, a small cell called polar body, while the haploid set of chromosomes is aligned in metaphase to spindle. This is uh, the stage when oocyte is fertilizable. Anaphase two and separation of sister chromatids takes place only if oocyte is, oocyte is released from M2 block by activating sperm. Thanks to modern live microscopy approaches, we can now observe the process of chromosome segregation in live human, uh, human oocytes. This immature oocyte was, uh, almost oocyte was injected with fluorescent reporters to visualize key components of chromosomal uh, segregation machinery. On the left, you will see oocyte appearance in transmitted light, and on the right, uh, there will be a fluorescent confocal image. DNA uh, is labeled in pink, and microtubules building on the myotic spindle are in green. And now you can see the vesicle, uh, germinal vesicle breakdown, chromatid aggregation, and microtubule nucleation. The assembly of bipolar spindle takes several hours, and chromosomes are aligned just shortly before anaphase, which we will see in a minute. Now, 
uh, and now polar body has been extruded and M2 spindle slowly reforms. As you can see here, that uh, on the timer, the human onset maturation takes more than 24 hours. This is in sharp, co sharp contrast to mitotic cells in which spindle assembly typically lasts less than 30 minutes. Here you can see synchronized cells in Drosophila embryo. In somatic cells, centrosomes act uh, as major microtubule organizing centers. They drive microtubule nucleation, stabilize spindle pores, and ensure fidelity of chromosome segregation process. But in mammalian oocytes, uh, uh, canonical centriol containing centrosomes are missing. In the absence of centrosomes, human oocytes rely on an alternative mechanism of microtubule nucleation from chromatin. Uh, but acentrosomal spindle pores are loosely focused and pro prone to disaggregation at the absence of centrosomes. And uh, there is inherent dynamic instability of the meiotic spindle, which makes human oocyte prone to chromosomal missegregation and also to sensitivities to suboptimal uh, culture conditions such as cooling, altered pH, and osmolarity. So that's why we have to be very careful about keeping human oocytes in optimal temperature during all ma manipulation in, in clinical settings. So the presence of bipolar metaphase two spindle together with first polar body indicate that oocyte has completed meiotic maturation and is ready for fertilization. But in clinical practice, we cannot introduce fluorescent reporters or fixed label oocytes to visualize metaphase to spindle, like on this image. So it's customary to assume that all polar body displaying oocytes are mature and ready to be fertilized by ICSI. But it's important to keep in mind that in vivo, oocyte is ovulated only when meiosis one was completed and oocyte is arrested in M2 stage. But in IVF simulation cycles, multiple oocytes are retrieved from pre-ovulatory follicles, and the cohort of obtained oocytes vary in their developmental potential. In ICSI cycles, the new duration performed, uh, is performed to evaluate oocyte morphology and maturation state. But uh, uh, Based on, the, uh, based, uh, based on their appearance in stereo microscope, oocytes are routinely classified into three groups. Um, only polar body displaying M2 oocytes are being subjected to sperm injection, uh, while immature GV oocytes with intact nuclear membrane and M1 oocytes, which uh, do not have, no longer have germinal vesicle, but still do not, have, uh, do not show first polar body, are commonly discarded. But it has been it has been shown that uh, many immature oocytes triggered to uh, which, which were triggered to resume meiosis in vivo are capable to complete maturation in vitro, uh, even though they are generally inferior to those who completed maturation in vivo. Oocytes which extruded polar body in vitro can still give rise to live births. Uh, this is the we will now focus on, on polar body extrusion visualized by live imaging. And you will see, just note that appear, emergence of first polar body considerably precedes arrest in metaphase two. It's the same movie you've seen before. So again, DNA is in pink and uh, microtubules well, making, building up the, the mitotic spindle are in green. Uh, this time, the time zero is the moment when polar body becomes first visible. Now, and you can see that it takes a couple of hours before M2 spindle is assembled. So polar body could be observed well before the maturation is actually completed. Uh, this is demonstrated on this slide as well. And you can see that the presence of polar body could be really misleading us. Some seemingly mature polar body displaying oocytes might, st might still be engaged in chromosomal segregation or early stages of meiotic, meiotic spindle reconstitution. Such oocytes are not yet ready for sperm entry. 
and precocious premature sperm injection could diminish their developmental potential. But how can clinical embryologists discriminate fertilization competent M2 oocytes arrested in M uh, metaphase 2 from oocytes which have not yet completed maturation process? Uh, polarized light microscopy, or I, will I will use the abbreviation PLM, proved to be instrumental for this purpose. This technique is, used, uh, is based on optical properties of anisotropic substances, such as axial crystals and uh, oriented biopolar mouse, such as, my, such as microtubules of my, my, myotic spindle. These highly ordered materials split a single beam of unpolarized light into two rays, each traveling in a different direction. This phenomenon is called double, double reflection or birefringence. And it's demonstrated here on the piece of calcite crystal placed on a single pencil drawn line. Uh, um, uh, the, the line appears as two lines. It's the, the product of this double re reflection phenomenon. When biorefringent materials interact with polarized light, two individual wave components, which are oriented in mutually perpendicular, perpendicular planes, are generated. Polarized light microscopy measures retardance, which arises when the two orthogonal beams are differentially slowed as they pass through highly ordered substances, anisotropic substances. Uh, the relative mag magnitude of retardance is an indicator of density, high order alignment, and thickness of the birefringent object. So it's based on a physical principle. Um, it's based on a physical principle and it's non invasive. That's why it's used in life sciences uh, uh, to non invasively image birefringent structures in living cells and can be. Uh, so since uh, the polarized light is just uh, it's, it's, it has the same intensity as visible light, it's just part of the spectrum. Uh, it, it's safe to examine human oocytes used for fertility treatment. Uh, the dense array of, uh, of parallelly oriented microtubule, microtubule fibers building meiotic spindle produce detectable biorefrigerants, as well as a highly ordered mass of zona pellucida. The presence and positioning of myotic spindle have been, uh, have been has been analyzed by multiple studies. Majority of these studies found that detectable uh, M2 spindle signal is a positive marker of X developmental competence. In our recent study, we found that all sites exhibiting uh, myotic uh, spindle signal are more than three times uh, more likely to produce viable blastocysts than all sites without spindle. The opsite, it's important to keep in mind that opsite spindle is proportional to the degree of structured organization of the material of the spindle in our case. Only highly ordered molecular mass of the bipolar spindle can be detected by polarized light microscopy, while uh, a polar Mm, loosened or disarrayed spindles. Uh, spindles will produce only blurred birefringence or none at all. So the fact that you cannot see the spindle, this, this, uh, the spindle signal and uh, using polarized light microscopy doesn't mean that the spindle is totally absent. It could be visualized using fluorescent microscopy. The incidence of spindled M2 oocytes is affected by patient's genetic background, just general fitness of the cell. So there could be genet different genetic background, medical condition, and obviously maternal age. In addition, the presence of the developmentally delayed oocytes will increase the proportion of spindle negative oocytes. And that's because oocytes extruding polar body uh, uh, in vitro undergo through physiological transitional stage during which uh, mitotic spindle undergoes structural reorganization and during this stage is not detectable by uh, polarized light microscopy. If um, the spirofringent spindle signal may emerge when oocytes are kept in culture to later time, 
So in these oocytes, which are just undergoing physiological transition from M1 to M2 stage, uh, the lack of the spindle signal might be only transient and could be detected later. Uh, this real-time observation of phase-specific biorefrigerance pattern and its interpretation in the context of knowledge of spindle dynamics during meiotic maturation provides opportunity to optimize time of ICSI. And this is uh, the, the, adjusting the time of X inje uh, of sperm injection to the developmental stage of oocytes is particularly important in oocytes that extrude polar body in vitro. Um, in general, oocytes are expected to complete their maturation within 36 hours post HCG triggering in injection. However, in uh, slow responders, the whole pool of oocytes might be developmentally delayed which means that after six, uh, 36 hours, you will have uh, uh, the, the patch of oocytes which are immature. Uh, in cycles with very few uh, mature or M2 oocytes available for fertilization, uh, individual, individual time ICSI of these late maturing oocytes uh, can serve as a rescue strategy, uh, an alternative to cycle cancellation. So simply sometimes we do not have uh, M2 all sites available. In that case, it's worth uh, very finely optimized time of ICSI for late maturing all sites. Um, polarized light microscopy, visualizing spindle biorefrigerants, makes it possible to discriminate all sites arrested in M2 stage from those undergoing physiological transition from M1 to M2 stage. Postponing ICSI provides these late maturing oocytes with more time to re reassemble M2 spindle. Uh, in our study, nearly 60% of initially spindle negative oocytes showed M2 spindle signal during re re-examination approximately two hours later. Um, the oocytes which are exhibiting this microtubule bridge that corresponds to anaphase to telophase stage, require a longer time to develop M2 spindle uh, because they are simply in, in um, earlier stage of development. So just postponing ICSI provides these oocytes with extra time to complete the process of maturation and assemble the spindle. Um, However, extending pre-incubation time should not be generalized to all oocytes. In vivo mature oocytes uh, from normal responders typically exhibit an M2 spindle after retrieval and post-ovulatory aging decreases their developmental competence. Therefore, uh, oocytes display, displaying distinct bipolar spindles should be subjected to ICSI without further delay. Uh, this brings me to methodology, um, a device capable of biorefringence visualization is required, obviously for non-invasive spindle imaging. Um, it's an add-on mounted on your inverted microscope. Uh, there are different commercial systems available on the market. Uh, they all allow simultaneous view of all site morphology and spindle biorefringence. Uh, but they differ in sensitivity, image pros processing capabilities, level of background, and anal you know, analytical power, documentation software, and obviously price. Um, critical point uh, uh, when you are assessing uh, presence of the spindle in uh, all sites is to uh, um, bear in mind that spindle biorefringence is orientation dependent. Uh, to maximize chance of spindle visualization, all sites ha uh, have to be turned around each axis. It will be visible on this video. Uh, initially, uh, spindle negative all site is rotated, and you can see that the spindle signal is coming up. So, uh, if there was no rotation, this all site would be. Uh, misdiagnosed because spindle, well, spindle signal was not visible on the first side. So before declaring absence of the spindle, rotate the oocyte 
under uh, under the um, polarized light microscope. Uh, to, as I mentioned, this, the myotic spindle is very delicate and fragile structure. To minimize the risk of spindle disruption, temperature, pH, and osmolarity, it must be kept in optimal range. Uh, um, egg maturity assessment is uh, an additional uh, manipulation with all sites and should be done quickly, ideally within, within 10 minutes. Um, Importantly, the polarized light microscopy must be performed uh, on a glass button dish because plastic dishes impair uh, biorefringence image analysis or image uh, biorefringence detection. Um, but be aware uh, that glass button dishes have different thermal characteristics than plastic exit dishes. Uh, so heat state settings must be adjusted accordingly to uh, ensure 37 degrees within the droplet uh, of the media. Um, obviously, operators' micro manipulation skills uh, have impact on uh, examination accuracy. Previous experience with micro manipulation is desirable. Um, it's uh, I would recommend to train on circles uh, in mature all sites just let them mature in in vitro overnight and mo most of them will develop a myotic spindle so you can practice on them um, not very conveniently postponing ICSI uh, creates the, the need of working late hours so you have to have trained personnel available at the workplace even in uh, late afternoon hours uh, if you are interested in stepwise uh, stepwise step protocol how to perform spindle imaging in clinical settings uh, it's available online i won't go into very details here but what's important to uh, bear in mind is that polarized light microscopy or spindle imaging um, shouldn't be done in all uh, all exit cycles it's not necessary uh, um, to our uh, experience, um, uh, cycles with fewer than six M2 sites uh, up in retrieval, and proportion proportion of late maturing all sites extruding polar body in vitro benefit the most from individualized optimization of ICSI. Uh, it's a uh, it, the, it's an excessive manipulation, it's uh, time consuming and laborious. So really use it only in indicated cases where uh, it's likely that the whole pool of all sites is developmentally delayed. Uh, now you might be wondering whether you can somehow use the knowledge of uh, also of all site maturation and adjusting uh, timing of ICSI if you do not have polarized light microscope in your laboratory. Uh, if the off-site um, denudation is performed uh, shortly before ICSI, it's impossible in, in light microscope to distinguish whether the off-site is really arrested in M2 stage or has just started to extrude a polar body. In that case, you have to have polarized light microscopy to distinguish these two populations uh, of all sites. But if you are doing early denudation, uh, then um, you can simply separate M1 all sites from M2 all sites or all sites exhibiting polar body. And if you keep them uh, in, uh, in culture for additional four hours before ICSI is performed, they, they had uh, sufficient time to complete maturation. Those also, if you need to use M1 all sites in vitro matured, uh, check them regularly and mark the time where you, uh, when uh, first polar body is first visible. And then shuttle ICSI two to four hours later. So simply provide these developmentally delayed or late maturing all sites with more time to complete the process of maturation. As all methods, uh, also 
uh, egg maturity assessment has its limitations. Uh, um, Obviously, all site maturity is a basic prerequisite for uh, successful fertilization and embryo development, uh, but it provides no information about chromosome organization. There might be severe chromosome misalignment uh, and maternal age related chromatid splitting in all sites, featuring a nice bipolar spindle like on this on this picture. So. With current technologies, we do not have tools to visualize chromosomes. We can only visualize spindle in life all sites. So the information is limited. Uh, and obviously there are various other factors that have significant impact on uh, reproduct uh, reproductive success, like sperm, all site mitochondria, um, or even if the embryo, if there is a successful fertilization, it might be uh, errors during mitotic division. Uh, endometrium is a big player in, in this game of also epigenetics and uh, uh, genome activation. So just the presence of uh, meiotic spindle does not guarantee successful pregnancy. Uh, we have to be realistic in benefits of this technology. So to conclude or to sum up what I've been talking about, polarized light microscopy allows non-invasive spindle imaging in live human oocytes. Uh, presence of N2 spindle signal is a marker of egg maturity and readiness for fert fertilization. Some polar body displaying oocytes might be still engaged in chromosome segregation process. So they could be deceiving us by their appearance. Uh, when sperm is injected prematurely, uh, fertilization and developmental potential of these oocytes is diminished. Uh, late maturing oocytes extruding polar band in vitro can reach full development to maturity when ICSI is postponed to later hours. So just simply providing them with extra time could uh, increase the chance that uh, these oocytes will be fertilizable and produce. Uh, viable embryos. Preventing untimely ICSI is particularly important in stimulation cycles with low number of M2 oocytes available for ICSI. In that case, you might need, might want to use these late maturing oocytes. As I said, although they, ha they are inferior to those uh, which completed maturation in vivo, they still can produce live births. So I would like to thank you for attention and I'm ready to take your questions. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Hobskova. Um, we received one question so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question is, do you recommend to inject immature oocytes or wait to next day uh, do you have any statistics on it? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. Um, when I was talking about rescue uh, in vitro maturation, I meant uh, using uh, all sites uh, which extrude polar body very soon, shortly after retrieval, and injecting, waiting for them to mature. So not to inject M once because these are diploid; they have the wrong amount of chromosomes. Uh, let them mature, but within uh, one day. Uh, as I said, uh, um, there is also effect of egg aging. So we've tried to uh, mature all sites even to the next day, but uh, the results were not very good. We achieved some fertilization, but never a viable um, or viable pregnancy. So I would recommend to uh, mature immature all sites only uh, during uh, on the day of retrieval do not incubate them overnight. So that's why I mentioned those late working hours. So let's say 6, 5, 6 p.m. Okay. Um, so a couple, a couple of more questions are coming in now. And the second one is, do you think that it's better to denude earlier to see the stage of development or can we just keep all eggs two or three hours after pickup, 36 hours after CGH injection? Uh, 
We are routinely doing early denudation because it provides us with information about maturation stage at the time of retrieval. And based on this information, we decide whether to perform or not to perform uh, spindle imaging. Because if we've got H215, M2 all sites, uh, we've done this checkup already, and these are typically spindle positive. So to my experience, it's better for decision making, for early decision making, which is important in clinical practice because you also also have to obtain uh, informed consent for these procedures. Uh, it's better to do early denudation, but uh, if you are used to do late denudation and you have polarized light microscope, you can still perform spindle imaging before ICSI. Okay. And gain that information. Okay. Um, the next question, uh, the denuded oocyte uh, is more vulner vulnerable, uh, for example, being unable to control PHI. How do you weigh this risk against the possible? Actually, yeah, exactly. It's about weighing benefits and risks. Uh, it's, uh, I think, with current media, which are buffered, uh, the risk of P and, and if you are, if the, um, the manipulation is is done according to guidelines, I think that risk of uh, pH fluctuation can can be limited. It's 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 minimal. So I think the benefit of knowing maturation stage, in my eyes, outweighs the risk of uh, a suboptimal pH. I think this could be handled. Okay. Um, next question: How early can we denude the oocytes? Excuse me. How uh, how early can we denude the oocytes? Yeah. Uh, up and pick up. Um, uh, we do it within 20 minutes after pickup. So without unnecessary delay. We do not leave two hours or more um, the cumulus in, in, in culture. Uh, there is that presumption that cumulus provides uh, some milieu for all site development, but if the all site maturation has been completed in in vivo, a gap junctions, which represent the communication pathway between follicle cells or granulosa cells and oocyte are already closed. So um, eggs are capable of maturing in vitro without support of follicle cells. Okay. Which are, yeah, which are actually during development, follicle cells are uh, keeping the meiotic block. So it's, it's the other function actually. Okay, um, the next question, how long can we wait for M1 to turn uh, M2? Any data on time and live births? Um, so we, we wait for M1s uh, until, until midday, to checking whether they extruded polar body. If they do not extrude polar body, they are probably still in very early stage of uh, meiosis one and uh, we do not wait for them for long. So, uh, so those and ones which are able to extrude polar body um, before midday, they, are, uh, they could be utilized and they can produce live births. Uh, actually, yeah, somebody asked about the data, they, uh, uh, they are published in our study, which is, yeah, and we, we've got statistics on it, so. And we've, we actually achieved, uh, at the time of publication, there were 12 live births from, and yeah, this, is, this is the study. Uh, at the time of publication, we had 12 live births from uh, all sites which extruded polar body in vitro. Now we are close to 20. So in principle, yeah, their developmental competence is lower if they failed to complete maturation in vivo, but it's not zero. And I'm talking about case, clinical cases uh, with very poor prognosis, where you have very little, very few or no M2 all sites at retrieval. So just simply waiting, individualizing, optimizing time of ICSI can make a difference for these poor prognosis patients. Okay. Um, the next question, fragmented polar body can be indication of poor meiotic spindle, or is it, yeah, I'm not sure it's a question, but. 
from my experience, when I was uh, performing live uh, side microscopy, uh, live imaging my, uh, microscopy in, in human on sites, it's true that fragmentation is the, um, it happens uh, later uh, in the development after, after polar body extrusion. Initially, the polar body is nicely rounded and then later it can get fragmented. So it could go hand in hand with spindle deterioration. I'm prone to believe it, but I personally do not have this data. Okay. Um, next question. At what time post OPU do you suggest doing early de denudation? Yeah, I think we had this question already um, within 20 minutes without further okay. delay. Yeah, okay. Um, how, long do I, how long do I have to wait in hours before injecting? an immature oocytes? It's, it has to be, it's, it's very individual. It depends when the other, the, each or um, the, the uh, in, uh, particle oocyte extruded polar body. If you see, first see the polar body, mark the time and shuttle the uh, ICSI, if you do not have polarized line microscope, shuttle ICSI two to four hours, hours later. That's my advice. Okay. Um, the denuded oocytes uh, are more vulnerable, for example, being unable to control PHI. How do you weigh the ri this risk against the possible benefits of delayed XC? I think I, I answered this question already. Yeah, um, the buffers, availability of buffers, and uh, yeah, uh, the follicle cells are no longer needed for maturation. Okay. Um, do you have any data regarding chromosome aneuploidy oh, rates regarding MI matures in vitro uh, before XC at uh, M1 matures in, in vitro before XC at M2? Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, it's uh, the chromosome constitution in the all site is meant or um, genetic constitution of resulting embryos. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, yes, so do you have any data regarding chromosome and neuploidy rates regarding M1 matures in vitro before XC at M2? Okay, it's not clear from the question whether it's egg aneuploidy is meant or uh, resulting embryo aneuploidy. Uh, I do not have data about egg aneuploidy, but it's going to be definitely uh, dependent on mother's age or women's age, on, on women's age. Uh, it's likely that these, as I said, these in uh, late maturing oocytes, they are inferior to those which managed to mature in vivo. I do not have data because I would have to fix them. So I, I do not have data on this. In terms of uh, PGT in resulting embryos, we have some data, but not that many at the moment, because uh, these are typically poor prognosis cycles and they do not have many embryos. They do not wish to have them genetically tested. So, but it's it's likely that they will, they might be more aneuploid, those in vitro, which can have to be, have to complete maturation in vitro. But as I said, sometimes this is for cases where you've got something or nothing. Okay. Um, the next question, what is your recommendation to do ICSI after denudation? Well, what is my recommendation? When or? Yeah, to, to, what is your recommendation to do ICSI after denudation? <laughs> uh, ICSI must be done after denudation. So yes, yeah, yeah, ICSI is performed on denuded all sites. The, the question is timing. Somebody, some Clinics prefer to do late denudation and some early denudation. Uh, published studies didn't show any significant difference. So it shouldn't be harm, uh, you shouldn't be harming all sites just by, by doing early denudation. Okay. Um, then the next one Do you prefer conventional IVF for mature all sites? Specific, uh, especially M1, rather than XC to avoid oocyte aging? That's an excellent question, actually. Yeah, I think conventional, conventional fertilization uh, might, might be the, 
yeah, I, it's more physio. Well, if I said physiological, but it's more more close to physiological fertilization. But uh, clinics prefer to do denudation and ICSI to uh, to. It's pr probably for statistical reasons so you can show the much better fertilization rate than if you fertilize cumulus, which might contain GVO sites or M1 sites. So, okay. yeah, but if you if you are doing conventional IVF, you cannot assess maturation stage of the oocyte because it's it's difficult to be yeah it's difficult to be assessed when oocyte is enclosed in cumulus. Okay, um, then the next one: Do you recommend double trigger for stimulation with antagonists? Ha! Huh, that's that would be yeah, i'm a researcher i'm not i'm not um, a medical doctor so I, i'm probably not the right person to answer this question okay yeah, so i cannot answer sorry that's okay and then we go to the next one do early maturing oocytes have different embryology and implantation to late maturing oocytes different implantation uh, different embryology and implantation to late maturing oocytes? Different embryology? Well, I think that the principles should be the same and implantation is, as I said, oh, yeah, that's affected by endometrium. So it's an interplay between embryo and endometrium. I I think I think we have to think about oocytes as a very uh, individual cells. Each of them is different. Uh, using stimulation, we are retrieving more oocytes, but just think about that in vivo, only one of them would be ovulated. So they differ in their developmental competence. So it's really difficult to make any general generalized statements about some oocytes because there is different medical background, different aging. They, we haven't spoken about morphological features which are quite obvious on alt ultra structural level that they differ, the metabolism differ. So um, it's difficult for me to make a general statement about embryology of late maturing oocytes. Okay. Um, then the next one, if I have not PLM, um, is it recommended to do ICSI after two or four hours? Yes, if you uh, uh, if you do early denudation, if you already have information that yet yeah, this oocyte is late maturing, is it was M1 at the time of retrieval and it extruded polar body in vitro, then mark the time when you first see the polar body and schedule ICSI after two to four hours. Okay. Um, next one. What do you constitute as early de denudation? Uh, early denudation within those twenty, yeah, twenty minutes after after retrieval. A late denudation would be after four hours. Okay. Typically three to four hours. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't specify. Okay. Um, what do you uh, know about cytoplasmic maturation and why is it important for nuclear? and uh, cytoplasmic maturation to be synchronized? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. It's really, uh, when I was talking about oocyte maturation, I st uh, stuck to nuclear nuclear aspect of oocyte maturation, but there is also cytoplasmic maturation. It's a change uh, of organelle morphology and uh, distribution. Uh, we are actually investigating it uh, using electron microscopy. And uh, yeah, these two processes have to be synchronized. It's just that cytoplasmic maturation is really difficult. It's, it's with the current state of technology, it's impossible to assess it in uh, non-invasively. So to my knowledge, spindle, uh, spindle imaging is the only way how to assess somewhat X developmental stage. The others are always involving some invasive procedures and are still experimental. But yes, cytopl cytoplasmic maturation should be synchronized, but it may not happen. We could have mature oocytes, mature oocyte with uh, M2 spindle, but uh, the cytoplasm um, does not have a typical pattern for uh, typical pattern for mature oocytes. But I 
think there is not much known about this aspect. Okay. Um, did your study compare fertilization and pregnancy outcomes looking at different denudation and injection times? And what is the no. optimal sorry, mm -hmm. what is the yeah. optimal injection time for normal developed oocytes? Uh, it wasn't part of our study because there are many studies published on this topic comparing early and late denudation and they didn't find uh, a significant difference. Uh, what was the other part of the question? Um, uh, what, is, what is the optimal injection time for normal developed or For science? normal. I yeah. think those 36 hours as uh, 36 hours plus four, so 40 hours, I would say for normal responders. Yeah. Okay. Um, Obviously, you have to distinguish again, um, uh, let's say, all sites from egg donors, which are more robust. They come from healthy women. They behave differently than all sites from um, women at advanced age or women who have mostly a late maturing all sites. So again, general, generalize, it's, it's difficult. So. <laughs> Okay, um, then the next one, do you have any explanation of uh, M2 arrest and how can you separate a specific patho pathology from fertilization failure? M2 arrest? M2 yeah. arrest is physiological and it's actively, the, the RS is actively kept by cascade of molecules and uh, the, the cell is released from this arrest uh, by activation it has to be activated by sperm, uh, which brings um, activating factor, which is now known the major, the, the prominent or the main player in this in this in in this molecular cascade is known to be PLC zeta. So arrest is physiological. I think this is meant by what was meant by the question is probably fertilization failure when uh, sperm is injected, but it, they it doesn't um, activate the oocyte and there could be a problem in that activation factor brought by the sperm or uh, molecules which um, are responding to this uh, to this activation signal on oocyte side so it could be on both sides but um, yeah in some clinics they use oocyte activation using ionophore to overcome this problem but M2 arrest is physiological. If they, if all sites do not arrest in M2, they undergo parthenogenesis. They okay. undergo on a phase two and yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next question: Do you think or do you have experience if there is difference of maturation in vitro between culture before uh, you do ICSI with incubation in just five percent C? Uh, 0,2 or 5% uh, CO2 or 5% CO2 plus 5% O2? Hmm. <laughs> I do not have such data. I know, yeah, it's just generally assumed that lower site concentration within culture is better for embryonic development. I'm not aware of study which would be assessing this pre-fertilization stage on all sides. We are commonly culturing all sides in five, five percent okay. or six percent CO2. So yeah. it's more, I think it's more about oxygen than CO2. So I don't know whether the question might have been meant in this way. It's, it's more oxygen, which is discussed. So, okay. Um, other question, based on your studies, what can you say on vitrification of M2 oocytes? Which oocytes might survive vitrification better, ones which are in the transition from M1 to M2 stage or the ones which uh, are fully matured? That's a brilliant question. Actually, yes, there, there are studies which compare um, uh, vitrification of GVs versus M2s. And even though you would expect that when the, the nucleus is present and chromatin is uh, somewhat protected by this nuclear membrane, the results were better for M2 all sites. Um, it's, um, I'm currently investigating this and it's uh, definitely recommended to vitrify all sites which already have uh, 
metaphase to spindle. If you, for some reason, have to vitrify a site which is still in telophase, you have to uh, leave uh, the time for completion of maturation after following. I do not have much data on comparing these two groups, like for experimental purpose, because uh, in patients it would be, from my point, un unethical. So I, I tend to keep them mature before uh, reach the metaphase two stage before they are being vitrified okay um next question if you have a couple of m1 oocytes and you decided to leave them to mature do you have a special media for culturing these immature ones uh no no it's not it's not special medium it's uh it's a common it's a common medium you can you can look it up in our studies but it's not it's not it's not the the, the medium for in vitro maturation of follicles maybe this is this is actually good comment it's it's good to mention it because sometimes in vitro maturation the ivm is uh, uh in literature it's referred to uh, the protocols when uh, very uh, yeah at least yeah when follicle uh, uh, Prematuration or sites enclosed in follicles are cultivated in vitro. What I was talking about is the cultivation in vitro maturing of uh, GVO sites to M2 stage. So it's it's not that cultivation of uh, uh, follicles, which which early follicles, which requires special medium. This is not the case. These these all sites were triggered for maturation in vivo. So it's it's just the, the the nomenclature is not really clear at the moment. Okay. Um, what can be a cause of the oocyte lysis after ICSI? Can it be related to the immaturity of the oocytes? Hmm, I don't think this is uh, this is particularly related to to maturation stage. It's uh, probably more related to in cytoplasmic uh, fitness. Uh, organization of organelles and ICSI technique. So I don't think this is this is related to to maturation stage. Even till phase one oocytes could be injected with sperm and they won't lice. Okay. They just they do not develop properly, so they do not give rise to good quality embryos. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you think that ovarian tissue trauma has a role on oocyte maturation process, especially in maturation arrest cases? Hmm. Mm, that's an interesting question. I don't know, but it's very likely that some traumas can change the ovarian milieu. Um, I cannot exclude it. It's true that some inflammatory disease have been accused of this. Also, endometriosis is no, known to affect quality of all sites. So whether some mechanical trauma could affect maturation rate, rate maturation ratio could be. I cannot exclude it, but I do not have data on this. OK. Um, do you prefer to use uh, IVM media for the M1 uh, oocytes or just the usual culture media they were already in? Yeah, usual culture media, IVM, IVM media supplemented with hormones, it's for follicle culture, when all sites are still enclosed in follicles. So, yeah, ordinary medium. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. There are really a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go a bit up. Um, Uh, what is your take on transferring a small amount of cytoplasm from a healthy oocyte to an oocyte whose cytoplasm is not healthy in sibling oocytes? Uh, in sibling oocytes? Yes. I haven't heard of this. This reminds me of oocyte regeneration when, when there are mitochondrial these either diseases or just um, recharging mitochondria, with, with, um, recharging the cytoplasm of um, old X with yeah donor X cytoplasm, but I haven't heard of sibling or uh, all site cytoplasm transfer. Uh, I, I I don't know, but I, I don't know actually. Yeah, I, I would be curious to see the date, the some some data on this. 
haven't tried it. Okay. Um, one last question. I'm gonna see if I can find an interesting one, which we haven't had yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe this one. Does exposure time to PLM affect oocyte comp competency or potential? It's not, um, yeah, that's a good question. It's not uh, exposure to PLM because it's a part of visible spectra. It's just an ordinary light. It's, it's, it's the same as you are viewing oocytes under stereo microscope. Um, but the time of examination, uh, could if could uh, if if it's if it's too long, as any other manipulation with all sides, could affect their fitness in case you do not have uh, you haven't optimized uh, the conditions, particularly temperature, osmolarity, and pH. But that's uh, that's a, that applies to all micro manipulation procedures involving human oocytes. So if you are, you just have to be careful there. They are very sensitive cells and particularly the spindle, maybe not just the spindle, but we know about spindle that this one, this, this structure is very sensitive to fluctuations, particularly with temperature. So double check, uh, sp spend your time, so double check that your um, uh, heated stage really uh, ensures 37 degrees within a droplet because sometimes if you have 37 on the display or sometimes you have it slightly higher it may not uh, give you just optimal temperature in the droplet so use the probe uh, thermometer to check that you are actually getting optimal temperature okay all right, um, I think we need to close the webinar now. Um, this was very interesting and we got a lot of uh, questions, so that's very nice, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we will, uh, well, the webinar has been recorded, so we will put it uh, available on our e-learning platform, which is freely accessible for all our members. And we will also put it available on our website on the uh, special interest group page of Embryology. Um, so thank you again, uh, Dr. Hobbs-Tova, for having this <laughs> webinar, <laughs> and thank you everyone for participating and for asking so many questions. Um, so uh, I wish you all a very nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.